Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the University of Westminster. It's lovely to see you all here. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I'm the course leader of the Masters here in Media, Campaigning, and Social Change. And it's a real privilege to be hosting this event tonight and to host George Lakey and his talk on winning campaigns in polarised times. I won't talk for long. We will get on to, to George's talk in, in just a moment. Uh, but it, it's particularly great to have George here and to have all of you, both students, former students, and a lot of people working in the not-for-profit sector and working voluntarily um, in activist and not-for-profit networks, because it summarises for me the, the whole ethos of, of the course, which is about collaboration and about sharing insights and sharing knowledge and, and working together. So there's a few members of the course advisory panel here in the audience, and I want to just do a bit of a shout out to them and thank them for being here and contributing to this collaboration. So we've got representatives from some of us over there and from Friends of the Earth. Um, and I think we've also got someone from Amnesty. I'm not sure if he's here yet, but just like to take the opportunity to say thank you for those organizations that help us kind of shape, shape the course. But I'm not really here to do a big promo about the course, so I'll move on from that and just go through a couple of sort of housekeeping points, really. There's a hashtag on the screen there that you've seen. There's a, a Wi-Fi login if your you know, 4G has run out. Uh, you might have realized that this talk is being live streamed. Um, so we are going to have a question and answer session at the end. If you'd rather not be live streamed and filmed asking a question, you can always tweet it using this hashtag, and uh, Natasha, who's organizing the event with me, will be able to field your questions by tweet if you feel more comfortable doing that. We might be taking some pictures as well. If anyone would rather their picture wasn't shared, just um, come up to me at the end and let me know, and we'll make sure that we don't include any of your images. I've been told specifically to talk about loos and fire escapes, which are as important at any event. So in the unlikely event of a fire, if you're in the first half of the room, there's exits here and here, and you can go to the street at the back, which is the kind of fire point. If you're in the back half of the room, if you just go back up the way that you came in, up the escalator and out to the street at the front. But touch wood, there won't be a fire. Uh, toilets, you may have seen, in fact, on the way in, women's toilets halfway up, men's toilets at the top, but we're only here for about an hour and a half, so hopefully that won't be information that you'll need. And finally, last bit of housekeeping, the running order for this evening. I will stop blabbing in a moment, and then we're going to talk to George, the main event. After his talk, we will have a, a question and answer session, and we can run that for quite a while. I think we've you know, allowed for about half an hour, so there's time for plenty of questions. And then before you go, we do have copies of George's new book for sale. So there will be a bit of a book signing at the end. So if you want to stay for that, don't miss that that opportunity. I think that's all the sort of logistics I needed to go through, more than enough logistics anyway. I'll just hand on to Natasha, who's going to formally introduce George. Thanks. So I think I can use this mic. Is that working? Great. Okay, so yeah, my name is Natasha Adams, and um, I've organised this event with Michaela. I'm actually um, a freelance campaign consultant, uh, and I worked with Michaela last year to organise a talk with here with Hari Han, which some of you might have come to. That one was a bit chaotic, the toilets exploded, and we had to find another venue at the last minute. It's all running much smoother this time, so yeah, that's all very good. Um, but yeah, basically, I was working with, I was doing some work with 350.org earlier in the year, and I heard that... Um, that George was going to be over and I had recently read an article that he'd written which I've tweeted so if you have a look at the hashtag George Lakey I'm at Tasha Hester on Twitter you can read that article um, I think it was in Waging Nonviolence and it was something like a 10 point plan to stop Trump and it talked about the kind of proactive strategy that we need to win right now and I thought that sounds great that sounds like exactly the sort of conversation we should be having so um, Daniel Hunter really kindly passed on George's email and then he was enthusiastic about doing the event Michaela was enthusiastic about hosting the event and um, lots of you wanted to come so here we are so thank you very much for coming um, 
I think that with the situation as it is now, um, thinking about how to win in polarised times is so important and things really do go in cycles and there are lots of lessons that we can learn from kind of social movements in the past and things that have worked elsewhere and so I know that George is going to be drawing on his experience from some of those and also talking about um, the Scandinavian countries and what they did in the 20s and 30s, um, which is quite interesting and not something that I know very much about and I think is also mentioned in his book. Um, so yeah, I guess you probably all know a bit about who George is, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, but he founded uh, the amazing Training for Change, which the training I really want to go on, it's happening in the UK again, Campaign Bootcamp are running it, so they're taking applications now, I think. Um, he has been a peace activist for many years, uh, specialising in non-violent direct action, has an incredible a catalogue of non examples of non-violent direct action and peaceful campaigning from all over the world. It's a database, um, which I think we might share the link uh, of later, or I, or I can share it on Twitter. Um, he's a lifelong campaigner. He's written so many books. Um, I think that's probably enough of a blurb from me. But yeah, George, welcome. And would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. What a treat to be here. I actually lived in London for a year, 1969-70, because Quakers brought me over to share some of what we had learned in the United States during the extremely turbulent and fiery 1960s. And so I had the luxury of spending a, a, a whole year, not just as in this book tour, you know, a, couple, a few weeks, but I, I had lots of opportunity to move around the UK and uh, get to know people. And since my forebears on my father's side come from this part of the world, it was a, a special coming home. And it feels like a coming home again for me. So thank you very much for inviting me, Michaela and, Nash, uh, and Natasha. When I started on the path that led to the book, Viking Economics, I had no idea how relevant that book would turn out to be for this political moment. Actually, when, when it really started was very long ago when I fell in love with a Norwegian foreign student who was studying in the United States. And uh, I don't suppose we ever imagine that when we're falling in love, there's going to be a book that comes out of it. But anyway, I certainly didn't. And uh, fortunately, she fell in love with me as well. And so we, uh, we got to spend a couple of years off and on together while she was studying. And then she got her degree. And uh, just before she got her degree, she agreed to marry me and then left and went back to Norway. So it took some doing. I was a poor student working my way through college and I had no money from a blue collar family, small town, rural Pennsylvania. And there was Love Lorn Me, if you could picture. And uh, <laughs> I guess we've all had our moments. And anyway, uh, missing my beloved, and there she was across the ocean. And there was my grandfather noticing me and deciding to give me a ship's ticket so that I could get on the ship and go to Norway. Five days after getting off the ship, we were married, which incentivized me to learn the language of Norway because, for one thing, I was curious to know what it, was it I agreed to that the priest said during the ceremony. <laughs> so that was a very powerful incentive. And, and then another one was that her, um, her family didn't speak English, so it was on me to learn how to speak Norwegian and, in order to make friends. And so I really, really worked at it. And what I noticed during that year, one thing after another, stranger in a strange land kind of situation, was that they really had a very, very different economic model from the one that I'd been brought up in. Very different approach. Different assumptions about what motivates people and different assumptions about what enables people to be highly productive and different results to show for it. This was 1959 when I encountered Norway, all right? And they were still rationing from the days of World War II when there had been German occupation, as you know, and uh, the Germans, as they left, did a scorched earth policy and burned and uh, destroyed a part of the country. And so it took 
and, and the, it, Norway had never been rich. It had always lacked um, resources, so it was always the poor cousin of Sweden, which was much more hefty. And so the recovery was very, very difficult for them. And it, as late as 1959, they were still rationing. So my father-in-law, who was a gardener, had to get permission from the government to be able to buy a new car, a new station wagon, for his business. So that's how they were eking things out. Nevertheless, they had decided to prioritize getting rid of poverty. And they'd gotten so far along in abolishing poverty that I had to search high and low to see any signs of poverty left. They'd gotten rid of their ample slums in uh, the city of Oslo and substituted excellent uh, public housing and so on. And of course, they had free university. They wouldn't think of charging people money for, uh, universe, for higher education. What an odd idea that would be, uh, thought they. And, and a whole lot of uh, assumptions that they made about how you treat uh, workers well and support them so that they, in turn, can create a highly productive economy, which in turn benefits everyone. That was the approach that they took. So that's what I experienced in 1959-60, the, the, uh, the working out of that. And I, I, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if my people knew about this? Now, of course, you might ask, where, where did you choose to live after that year of living in some degree of bliss compared with the United States? And I have to say, uh, we, we really thought it out. We talked it out and decided we would move back to the States. And that was because Norway had basically solved its problems. It really had its uh, economic model up and running. It had no oil, no gas, but nevertheless had shared prosperity. And, uh, and, and so I thought, well, Norway doesn't need me, that's for sure. I had a job I liked a lot, and I liked studying there. But, and I even had reconciled myself with her family, which did not want her to leave. And, and so things looked great there, but I felt my destiny was connected with my own country. So I wanted to go back. And Barrett thought, well, it's very peaceful here. It's, it's really kind of tidy, you know, and uh, not very dramatic. And wouldn't it be much more exciting to live in the United States? I mean, in Norway, we hadn't assassinated a prime minister in years. <laughs> you, know, that, that, you know, whereas in the US, Assassination, after all, it's kind of a live option, right? And, and, and all these kinds of things go on. So that would be a much more exciting country to live in. So I'll go and, uh, and George and I will, will live in the US. And so that's what we did. And naturally I tried to tell stories about what I had experienced to my friends and my relatives in the US. And they, I discovered, couldn't care less. Because after all, we lived in the greatest country in the world. I hope you've heard that. We live in the greatest country in the world. And what do we have to learn from anybody else? Nothing. So George, shut up. Let's talk about the latest on the sports teams. And uh, that, that'll take care of us, right? So this was, <laughs> this was a blow to me because I'm a storyteller. And the idea of not being able to tell the stories that I, I'd learned was disappointing. And decade after decade, you know, because I, we kept going back, and I did some work in Norway, and some, and some in Sweden, some in Denmark, and always had more stories. And I got more and more pent up because I couldn't tell the stories to my own people. And of course, I was working very hard in the civil rights movement. That's where I was first arrested. Each social movement that came along that I could pitch into, I, I did that. Uh, organized a group called Men Against Patriarchy when the women's movement was blooming so that we could work with men who were confused and upset because what are we going to do if women get free? Where does that leave us? And so Men Against Patriarchy was helping men figure out uh, that there's actually something for men still to do, even if we can't dominate, and joined the, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> joined the uh, gay liberation movement because I, I wanted to acknowledge to the world my gayness, and so I came out and, and got arrested at the Supreme Court for the largest, the largest civil disobedience we ever did in Washington in the Supreme Court. Uh, when the Supreme Court made the wrong decision about our rights. And so it was thing after thing after thing that I was doing. So it wasn't like, even though I was pent up about the Nordic countries, I, it wasn't like I was just sitting on my thumbs. 
But I was still pent up, right? Okay, finally, fast forward, 2008. You remember what happened in 2008? Yes. I think it happened here as well. Am I right? Yes. And 2008. And I'd hear people really worrying and angsting about, oh, what are we going to do? We're running toward the cliff. And, uh, and I, I decided to try again. So I would just get into the group and I would say, you know, when the Swedes had a situation, something like this, where the bankers had had the regulations taken off and they created a bubble based on real estate speculation and the bubble burst. And then I would stop expecting somebody to say, don't you think our hockey team is really going to make it this year? And instead, people said, what'd they do? What did the Swedes do? I thought, oh, my people are becoming humble. They actually are interested in somebody in, in another country. I mean, aside from a country to invade, but they're actually interested in a country that they might actually learn something from. And so that was the, uh, that was the point at which I started writing the book. And I was making my living as a professor in a college which got behind the book and said, sure, we'll send you to Norway and the other countries, Iceland and so on, do an interview and do, and do the book. So that's how the book came about. And you can tell from the way I'm talking about this that my real interest was just letting my people know how something that really works, works. So people reading the book would understand an economic model that way outperforms uh, the United States economic model. And by the way, the, the UK's economic model. So I, th I thought, well, that's a contribution enough, right? I didn't realize that really digging, digging, digging underneath, I would find out something very surprising to me, and that was that in the period when they were doing their changeover, and maybe I should emphasize that, the changeover, the turnaround, because 100 years ago, they were a mess, especially Norway and uh, Iceland, but Denmark was not doing great either, and neither was Sweden 100 years ago. They were hemorrhaging their people. People were fleeing those countries because there was an opportunity, right? There was major poverty, and so they were coming to the US and Canada, other places, hoping to be able to survive. And so their, their turnaround was really quite dramatic. So I had to get into it, right, to find out how does a nation turn itself around when it seems stuck in uh, un injustice, and stuck in huge inequality with major poverty and major you know, richness and all of that. And I was just so curious about that. Well, what I found out was that they made that turnaround at the period in their history when they had the greatest polarization. Huh, I was surprised. Well, what were they doing at that time that enabled them to move forward? Because you might assume out of polarization that uh, a, a polarization of, pe of people over whatever the issue would, would then get them stuck. They would feel, well, which way to, which go, which way to go? Right? And so they might feel stuck. But instead, they used their period of, solariz of polarization to move forward and achieve a big turnaround. So I got very curious about that. So as I analyzed the movements that made that happen, this is the first thing that I found. That they were operating in a way that was consistent with a social movement principle that um, my friend Bill Moyer came up with, uh, which is that successful social movements tend to have played in, within them four roles that are pretty different from each other and that seem to attract different people who want to play them. So first of all, just to describe them briefly, the helper role is, uh, consists of people who want to address the problem, you know, however the problem is showing up. They like to address that problem in as direct a way as possible. Poverty, well, then let's do, Let's, let's, let's make food available. People are hungry, right? So let's make food, set up food kitchens, that kind of thing, food uh, programs. Uh, let's collect clothes. Let's make sure people can get clothes, and so on and so on. Uh, the, the helper role, the direct service role, 
tra let's do job training and so on. It's all about directly, uh, directly addressing the people who are most victimized in an unjust situation. Uh, the second role, the advocate role, people who are advocates love to go to authority and say, you could change this situation because you have some power and you certainly have the responsibility to change the situation, so change it. So these are uh, often lawyers or people who are, um, people who for one re reason or another have a relationship with people in power and like to address those. Know a politician or, or are able to wend their way to some politician and say, change this. The third, the third role is the role of the organizer. Organizers, I've known so many organizers in my life and I've done some organizing myself. Organizers uh, love to get people working together. And sometimes it doesn't even matter what they're together about. It's just so lovely for an organizer to see lots of people, right? And what really delights an organizer is if we have this many people tonight, that tomorrow night we have more than we had tonight, like that kind of thing. So organizers love to move people together. And then finally, there's the rebel. The rebel uh, role is to make trouble for the system and to disrupt the system strongly enough so that uh, th there's change, because the system simply can't keep going on the basis that it's been going on because it's too uh, dislocated, it won't work anymore. So examples of the rebel role would be um, Dr. Martin Luther King, um, Mohandas Gandhi, who made it really hard for the British to keep the, uh, the Indian uh, empire going, and so on. Uh, th those are examples of the rebel role. So, all, so what Bill Moyer claimed was all four of those roles tend to be played out in successful social movements. So of course I was looking for that in the Norway, in Norwegian, Swedish, and the other experiences, and sure. I mean, there was Bishop Grundtvig in, uh, in uh, Denmark saying, co-ops are the way, co-ops are the way forward, and using the folk high schools which he invented in order to push more and more people to use uh, cooperative, uh, cooperative institutions and other new economic institutions in order to be building things that could work. Um, organizers, of course, would get involved in that as well because it brings people together. Um, the, the advocate role, yeah, they decided in each of the uh, four countries that I studied, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, they decided it would be useful to have a political party that would represent our movement, um, but let's make sure that that party is accountable to us. Because if we don't make sure of that, the thing about, the thing about people who get into slots like, say, MP slots, is that they start thinking for themselves, or they start uh, being accountable to the economic elite. And we don't really want them thinking for themselves or being accountable to the economic elite. We want them accountable to us, because we're the ones who are feeling it most strongly and who are doing the work. So they created uh, parties to, uh, to advocate for them in the parliamentary setup, but they didn't at all expect that that would do the job because they needed to have organizing people in larger and larger movements who had the potential through campaigns to exercise the rebel role and make it impossible for those countries to continue without making a major change. And so that, in short, was the, uh, was the, the Nordic story that I learned about. Took a lot of probing to find it out especially in Norway, people were very reluctant to talk, about, uh, to talk about how hard it was to make the change. They didn't want to tell about troops being called out you know, to suppress uh, movement people. Um, Sweden was the most dramatic situation. In 1931, when the troops came yet again to put down the workers, uh, there was this large group of uh, unarmed demonstrators that troops shot and, uh, and, and killed uh, and wounded a bunch. And then Sweden erupted with a general strike, which is one of the biggest things rebels can do, right? And uh, the general strike brought down the government of Sweden, pushed the economic elite out of dominance, that's key. And then there was the space created for them to invent the Nordic model. 
and they were inventing it for the first time, let's face it, nobody, at least nobody I've ever found in history has ever used the, uh, the economic model that was invented by the Nordics. And it turned out to be the best, the most successful model ever done historically. But they needed that political space in order to invent it. And in the, Nor in the Norwegian case, it wasn't s it, such a dramatic moment. It was year after year after year. And in my book, I tell the story of, uh, you know, one year it would be so many strikes, the next year more strikes, more strikes, more strikes, more strikes, until the uh, economic elite said, okay, we better sit down and work something out because you have made our, this country ungovernable. And so that's, again, the rebel energy uh, playing a role. Well, let's look a little bit more at this question of polarization. Since uh, polarization is what was going on in the Nordic countries at the time, they had Nazis marching in their streets. Uh, and you, you had Oswald Mobley, right? You had, you had uh, a fascist equivalent going on here at the same time. Um, and then they also had communists organizing for the dictatorship of the proletariat. I'm wearing my red. And so, it's, you know, so there was all that going on. Okay, well, uh, what, what seems to be happening with polarization these days and for quite a while, and I'm not saying it's the only reason for polarization, but it does seem to be uh, the most consistently, uh, the, con the, the variable that most consistently shows up associated with polarization is economic inequality. Uh, well, in my country, everything's set up for, even though we have historic levels of inequality, we're gonna get still more and still more. Even somebody with my long arms is not gonna be able to describe it. And uh, I've been asking it during my time in your country, what's the setup here economically? And I'm told it's, it's uh, essentially the same, that uh, everything's set for more and more and more and more inequality. So if this is true, then that means more and more and more polarization. And of course, polarization manifests itself in very ugly ways. We're ahead of you in that way, I think, in terms of sheer ugliness. Uh, and and uh, now we're killing people um, in, uh, as a result of polarization. The Charlottesville um, uh, uh, killing was illustrative of that. So that's going to go on. Okay, well, uh, at least in my country, people I know, I know a lot of people who are saying, this polarization is so terrible, we can't move forward, so we have to somehow mend our fences. We have to somehow find unity in order to be able to move forward. Well, that's not the Nordic uh, uh, experience. The Nordic experience was at their most polarized time was when they made their breakthrough. So, hmm, what's going on with that? Maybe what polarization really does for us, even though it's very hard on us, Maybe what it does for us is it creates the heat that we need, the volatility that we need, the shakeup that we need in order to reorganize. Theoretical physics teaches us that uh, following chaos comes a new order, right? It may not be the order you want. It may be the order that they got in uh, Germany, or it may be the order that they got in Italy, but it may, on the other hand, be the order they got in Norway and Sweden. So uh, maybe agency has something to do with the kind of order that comes out. That's my argument that it does. Uh, and that the Norwegians and Swedes were very smart about how they dealt with, uh, with um, the, the fascist threat especially. And the, the German left and the Italian left were not smart about how they dealt with the, uh, the fascist um, tendency there. Nevertheless, uh, if you've got motion, then you've got the chance, if you're a blacksmith, to make a horseshoe. You don't have much chance to make a horseshoe with a cold piece of steel. Um, the polarized U.S. in the 30s finally hit me. <laughs> I mean, I'd heard so many stories. You know, from when I was a youngster, I was always asking people, tell me more about the labor movement. Tell me more about so and so. It was terribly polarized time. The Ku Klux Klan was riding hard, right? Lots of Nazi and fascist uh, uh, goings on. Um, and at the same time, it was the glory period for the Communist Party in the 30s in the United States. 
Um, I'm told that your Communist Party did very well in the 30s and then even, even better in the early 40s. Um, and, and so uh, these, were, these were polarized times and the, the, uh, and they were, uh, they were times when things moved forward in our societies as well. So you had that big effect after World War II, right? When you got some real gains and, uh, and the same in uh, my country, we got some real gains out of that period of polarization. And then in our case, I'm not sure about your case, but in the, our case in the 60s and 70s, we got some real gains again. That was the birth of the women's movement, the second phase of the women's movement. And of course, uh, on race, we made enormous strides on race and, uh, and, and a number of other things. So positive changes happened in the 30s and positive change happened in the, uh, in, in the Nordic countries as well. But the thing was, what they had it all had in or rather what the Nordics had in common that the U.S. anyway didn't have much of, and that was vision. A picture of what they wanted. A picture of what they wanted. And that, I would argue, makes a big difference when you're organizing a social movement. If you're mainly reacting to things that you don't like, which is what protest very often turns out to be, it's very hard to build on it. It happens, and then it doesn't, and then it happens, and then it doesn't. It tends to be episodic. I've looked and looked, and I haven't found a single example of a society that made major change through protest, that has actually changed structurally through protest. I can't find a single one. In the cases that I know of where major changes have happened, somebody was projecting a vision and some portion of the population was pulled forward by the vision. They wanted that so badly, they were wanting to fight for it in order to get it. It really creates a kind of positivity among movement people. I want this, let's go for it. I may have to sacrifice, but my children will benefit from this, right? Later generations will celebrate the struggle because we are going to go for that, which we may not even get to taste ourselves, but that's what we want. It's that kind of thinking that uh, motivates the most successful movements. I call it vision. And the good news from the US, I don't know if you've heard this, although it was covered uh, by The Guardian, is that uh, in, on August 1st, um, 2016, the Movement for Black Lives offered its vision of a new society in the United States that would give us at least a chance to deal with racism. And as you know, racism is so endemic. It's a, it's a part of our, the founding of our country, moving in on the native peoples and stealing their land and killing them and so on. So um, it's, it's just so embedded in the American story that uh, there, there's not going to be any overnight solution, but the Movement for Black Lives people realized that if we're, if we're going to have any chance to make serious reduction of racism beyond what we did in the 60s, then we're going to have to tackle the economic institutions. Now, uh, I was very influenced by Bayard Rustin in the 60s. He was the major strategist for um, Dr. King. And I heard him say over and over, if we don't, I mean, this was in the midst of the civil rights movement, right? Turbulence, able, able to, you know, Dr. King could go into the Oval Office and say to the president, blah, 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 you know, whatever he had on his mind at the moment. Uh, it, was, it was that kind of uh, shaking moment that was going on in the 60s. And during that time, Bayard was saying, if we don't handle the economic structure of this country, then in 50 years, we're still going to have ugly, ugly racism. I heard him say that over and over. And he was right. So we can't keep postponing the addressing of the economic situation. But what the Movement for Black Lives did was it said, look, um, we, we do need to make these economic changes as well as other changes. You can read it, you can Google it, just uh, look for Movement for Black Lives Vision. And 
When I read it, I started crying because I thought, oh, Byard died too soon. <laughs> he just only could have lasted till now because he had worked so hard to push Dr. King and the other leaders to come out with you know, a manifesto, a, a, a statement of that kind. And here these young people uh, born of you know, in local insurgencies against police brutality had already had, had done that work. It was very exciting. And, uh, and what also moved me as I read these particular provisions, economic provisions, was that they were consistent, they were in alignment with what works in the Nordic countries. So in other words, these weren't like utopian fantasies or, you know, oh, in the best of all possible, yeah, well, I won't say that. But anyway, as an exercise of our imagination, we could picture people having a wonderful economy if da 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 It's not that. It's that the things that they suggested were things that have been working for 60 years. There's a track record. This is not rocket science. And then I got another thing in my a realization, which was, hey, we have it so much easier than they did in the Nordic countries. Because in the Nordic countries, they had to dream it up. <laughs> it didn't exist anywhere. They couldn't say, oh, well, you know, in the 17th century, blah, blah, blah. You know, all we have to do is adapt. I mean, they had to dream it up. Gunnar Myrdal, the economist, won his Nobel Economics Prize from a thesis that said, no, the classical economists are dead wrong about human nature. And human nature is very different from that. And if you want to get more into that later, we can. But anyway, it, it, very, very hard work had to be done by them in order to build an economic model that could outperform my countries, your countries, every, everybody else in the, in the, in the world. So, Whoa, they had to invent that. We don't have to invent it. All we have to do is take it. I don't think they would even you know, require that we pay them for it. <laughs> I think they would give it to us for free. What could be nicer? Now, uh, I know Michael Moore. So how many of you have seen Michael Moore's movie, Where Do We Inva Invade Next? I know, he, his, his premise is that we might have to invade countries like the Nordics and, and, uh, you know, and, and overwhelm them and plant the flag in order to, but I don't think that's really true. So, there we go, that's enough. How about this though? Next section, polarization follows the curve. Well, no, we did that. Is there, some, is there something else? Maybe we can go right into Q&A. This is, this is what I was just talking about. This is amazing. Somebody stacked the deck here and put the right things up. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, then what about this? Let me try some more. Boom, boom. Uh, there we go. There we go, there we go, there we go. Now, so um, I, uh, I want to say just a, a few more words about campaigns before I invite your questions. And that is that uh, as I already said, the campaigns that are just protests are not as powerful as the campaigns that have a vision to go forward. Um, but there's so much that we've learned about campaigning since the Nordic countries. That's another thing that makes our task easier. It's not like we're starting out with what is nonviolent struggle anyway or something which they, they didn't even have a term for it in those days. Um, we now know there's a whole scholarship, pe uh, political scientists, even in the, that hard-nosed subsection of political science called security studies, have been writing uh, empirical studies of how does nonviolent action work and how is it is possible to overthrow dictatorships, military dictatorships, through nonviolent struggle and so on and so on. So there's a whole science now about nonviolent struggle and how it can uh, work effectively. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to just underline in this growing, growing knowledge about how powerful campaigns can be is that campaigns um, and campaigns do some things that other modes of, of uh, social change work do not. Okay, so you're saying uh, in your mind, George is a rebel and he's going to sell his favorite thing. True, you got me. Uh, that is my favorite role, although I've been an organizer and advocate and helper, but I will admit that when it comes to power confrontation, with those who rule society. There's nothing like having power to meet power. 
And that's what campaigns can generate. The activist group that I'm part of these days, I'm always part of an activist group. Uh, this time it's a, it's, an, it's a Quaker group. It's called Earth Quaker Action Team. E-Q-A-T, Earth Quaker Action Team. Uh, that's because we want to be earth, we want to be earthquaking in our results. <laughs> we want to do action, 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 and we want to be a team because I don't know what you've heard about the U.S., but we're full of individualists over there, and we need to keep saying there is no I in team. We're going to work together on this. Okay, so we're this we're so we're this little group, and we started in a living room, and we decided that we were going to force the seventh largest bank in the country out of financing mountaintop removal coal mining. And uh, friends called me and said, George, now you really have gone off the rails because a group that starts in a living room is not going to do that. I said, oh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. It was, the, the bank we chose was the number one financer of mountaintop removal coal mining. And I don't know how well publicized that particular form of coal mining is, over here, but we already destroyed 500 mountains in the United States by blowing them up with dynamite in order to get the, uh, to get the coal. Twice the cancer rates uh, of, of, for people in those areas, birth defect rates up and so on. I mean, a huge disaster for people in terms of their health and in terms of the, the uh, climate, of course. And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool to force this bank out of the business? So we went to see the president of the regional uh, you know, part, and we told him the Quakers were coming after them. <laughs> I mean, we thought it was only fair, just to warn them, right? Well, his reaction was like yours. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I don't have any friends who are scared of Quakers. I just don't. I just don't. So, but anyway, we thought, well, we're giving them fair warning, right? And then we started, well, we knew, of course, what they're very protective about is their brand. Because in any struggle, what you want to do is find out the strengths of your opponent and the weaknesses, right? The points of vulnerability. They were very vulnerable about their brand because they were a go-go bank. They were trying to get more and more customers. They were especially trying to get millennials, right? And millennials are way more sensitive than some parts of the population about climate and uh, fossil fuels, that kind of thing. And they were marketing themselves as the greenest bank you could ever imagine. So they were hoping and the college students would come in and be their customers for life and all of that, right? So they even had big billboards, green bank, sign up with PNC Bank. So we thought, oh, this is beautiful, this is great. So, we, we, uh, so first of all, though, we had to invent tactics. A great thing, again, about now compared with then in the Nordic countries where people had pretty standard ideas about, you know, you do a strike, a strike, a strike. Um, but we, we know that there's this whole world of creativity that can drive other people crazy if you use it. And so uh, we, we were trying to think, now what would be a Quaker equivalent of a holdup? Because you may know in America, it's very, we have a great tradition of holding up banks. <laughs> you know, so if we could figure out how to hold up banks, this would be very good. And we figured out how to do it, a Quaker holdup. So the, character, the way it looked, and we were dealing with very small people resources, right? So we would just go in a bank, single file, and we would circle up maybe 15 people. And then we would sit on the floor, in the middle of the marble floor, you know, in this bank branch, and we'd start worship, Quaker worship. And, you know, people would be moved to testify, so people would pop you know, up and say, testify, and so on. And we'd sing, and stuff like that. Well, I don't know what your bank branch looks like, but I've not met a bank branch where people could go on doing business while there were people sitting on the floor praying and <laughs> testifying <laughs> and singing. The bank stopped. So the manager then had to, what to do, what to do, dilemma, dilemma. Of course, we had people designated to be talking to the manager, talking to the security guards and so on. And um, they finally, you know, the security guards order us out. We would refuse to leave. 
They'd call the police, the police would come. Sometimes we would leave because we didn't have anybody ready to be arrested that day. Other times there were some of us ready to be arrested, so we'd get arrested. So we kept doing that over and over and over. They never knew exactly where we would strike next. And then we, were, we, we grew, of course, because it's just tremendous fun to twist the tail of an enormous bank by doing this kind of thing. And we were very, uh, we always did trainings ahead of time so that people who had never engaged in risky behavior before could, uh, you know, could get, get the training and get the reassurance. We, and we had a whole craft to it, designated roles and so on, to, because we were very interested in growth and therefore, you know, going outside the choir, so to speak, to enlist more and more people to join us. And that's what we did. And we made it very easy for people to join us. And so we, we uh, kept growing and growing and growing, doing this more and more places. And they, uh, they were very disconcerted and then uh, started, uh, started uh, repression within their employees, make sure the managers didn't talk to us and so on. Thought, oh, this is very good. Now it's time to go after the shareholders. They are the 1%. Thank you, Occupy, for that term. <laughs> the 1%. So we went to shareholders meetings and at first we were nice and waited for the Q and A, the question and answer, and then we would, you know, we did that for two times and then we decided now it's time to escalate. Okay, a campaign as compared to, I'm getting to the point where I don't, I, I don't even go to most one-off protests because I think they, they usually are a waste of time. A campaign enables you to go over and over again and escalate at the point of vulnerability of the opponent, right? So we would escalate, escalate, escalate. So one point of vulnerability was the shareholders meeting, especially if you own stock. So we each bought a, a, a share, right? Very easy to do. And so, um, so I'll tell you about the escalation and this, this gives you the flavor of it. Um, so the escalation was we decided to uh, shut down the shareholders meeting. So 18 of us were able to get hold of a share so we go in there, uh, it was a large room, a larger room than this, I think, and we posted ourselves all over among the regular shareholders, figuring then when the police arrested, they'd have to go you know, in among the shareholders, pull us out, which would make us much more disruptive. And there were lots of police uh, in the back. Uh, waiting for us. We were surveilled, of course, they, they knew what we were going to do. We're very proud of that, by the way. We totally reject security culture. We regard being surveilled and infiltrated as a compliment. <laughs> so as soon as we get evidence of infiltration or surveillance, we're very proud of that. We tell everyone, guess what? We're strong enough to be worth their resources to pay attention to us. This means we're winning. Because if they didn't surveil us, we'd be so disappointed. <laughs> that means we're so inconsequential, they wouldn't even bother. That would be very disappointing. So we take full pride and credit for that. And so, uh, so, they, we, uh, and so it's very easy tactically to work around them, uh, you know, them having the surveillance. Um, so they knew what we were planning to do, and uh, although they didn't know about our thing about uh, sitting all over the place, um, I'll, I'll add just one more thing since a lot of you are students of campaigns and of, of uh, what works in campaigns. Um, we, our group tends to, uh, it is mostly Quaker, actually now it's majority non-Quaker, but anyway, uh, mostly middle class people. And have you ever noticed about middle class people that they are conditioned to be rule followers? Am I right? Yeah, kind of broad, you know, the kids are, now pay attention to the rules and you're going to school now and do what the teacher says and that kind of thing. So a lot of people are conditioned to be rule followers, right? Okay, so there we were. We were determined to go into this shareholders meeting and be so disruptive we would, we would shut it down, but with 18 people, most of whom were middle class and rule followers. How do you deal with that? So the anxiety was rising and rising among us, right? So uh, we go to our coach. Oh, another campaign point. Uh, I don't believe in having a campaign without a coach. You need a coach. You need somebody who's like stepping one step back and understands the group and its goals and so on, uh, but is like a consultant, you know, who can be gone to to give advice and counsel. 
So we go to Daniel and we say, Daniel, this is Daniel Hunter, who has a wonderful book out called Strategy and Soul. Anyway, uh, Daniel, we go to Daniel and we say, Daniel, we have all this anxiety. What should we do with it? And he thinks for a minute. He says, OK, so, OK, you're Quakers. I would say that Quakers are very good at meetings. Am I right? Those of you who are Quakers will know. Yes, we are very good at meetings, sometimes deplorably good at meetings. Sorry, meetings. meetings. Quakers are good at meetings. So he said, OK, then go with your strength. Just go in there and have a meeting. Have an agenda. Know who's going to speak to each item. It's just that you happen to be having your meeting for business at the same time as they're having their meeting for business. No problem. Oh, thank you, Daniel. So we went in with a lot of assurance because we were going on a skill that we already had, right? So we go in there and we're sitting all over the place and the, uh, the CEO is up on the stage with a, a bunch of the officers of the corporation and says, okay, we'll have the reading of the minutes. So the secretary gets up and starts reading, but that's just the moment when our agenda item is called for, right? So somebody pops up and starts doing our agenda item very loudly, by the way, and turning to the whole, address the whole shareholders. So there's the CEO up there. What shall I do? Shall I have the police cl clear them out now? And just as he's about to do that, that person sits down. Oh, visibly, the CEO is relieved. Oh, maybe they're done. This is their disruption thing, right? All right, we'll have the reading of the treasurer's report. So the treasurer gets up. You know what happens, right? <laughs> it's on and on and on. And the CEO is, is sitting up there. I almost have pity for him, poor man. I mean, poor billionaire. And finally, <laughs> and finally, he throws up his hands. I mean, I've read this in novels that people throw up their hands, but I had never seen anybody, have you ever seen anybody in real life throw up their hands? He did that. He threw up his hands and said, this meeting is adjourned. That was after 20 minutes of an hour and a half meeting. <laughs> we were all stunned. The shareholders were, but we were as well. We didn't expect such a quick victory. And then people started getting up and heading for the exits. And as we did, my daughter, who was one of the 18, starts singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It's our, it's our theme song. This little light of mine. So we're all headed, of course, joining in with her. I'm going to let it shine. Headed toward the exit, I look around. A bunch of the shareholders are singing, this little light of mine. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, disruption can be quite a, a merry sort of affair. It can be very hard, but it can also be uh, a, yet one more opportunity to express the positivity that is basically motivating us. It's not hate versus hate. You know, it's not, oh, I'm so angry with you and you're so this to me. It, it can be something of a very different flavor that mirrors what our values are. And that's one of the things that we can learn about campaigning. <laughs> that if we're able to incorporate, incarnate, you could almost say, incarnate our values in the way that we operate, we make ourselves actually quite attractive to others who want to join us and also di uh, disabling to the people who are threatened by us. And that's one way that you handle even military dictatorships nonviolently, by disabling the threat and by attracting more and more people to be on your side. Okay, so when you have a campaign, uh, a successful campaign, other campaigns come forward to, um, to do the same thing, right? There are multiple campaigns that we see that in the civil rights movement. There's so many examples, the anti-nuclear power movement. It's happening now in this country with regard to the divestment movement, right? Campaigns beget campaigns, inspire, inspire other campaigns. And when you have multiple campaigns, you call that a movement, right? The thing is that that often spurs other people to have campaigns about some other issue. Right? Because, well, there's people over there are getting something done, so maybe we should be, so the campaign's on this thing, and campaign's on this thing. And that's what 
Uh, that's what was going on in the Nordic countries, and that's what I lived through in, in the US. Multiple campaigns, which together then create a movement, but then you've got simultaneous movements going on around. Now, here's the trick, and, and it is a trick. It's, it's not clear uh, ahead of time. I don't know a formula for this. Uh, how to get the movements to work together, right? Because they tend to be uh, issue-specific or uh, demographically specific, right? So for example, in the US now, we have the Black Lives Matters movement, but we also have the Dreamers, who are based mainly in a Hispanic or Latino, or Latinx uh, group, and so on and so on. So we tend to have these. So the question is how to get the movements to work together. And again, vision can really make a difference to get a common platform that enables people to work together. And when that happens, you get a movement of movements, a movement of people's movements. That's when the 1% really starts to sweat. That is what they are terrified of doing. That's what was going on in the 60s and 70s to the point where there needed to be the Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan counteroffensive in order to shut you people down and in order to shut us people down. And that's what they did to some degree. Why did that happen? It happened because a lot of the movements responded to Thatcher and to, uh, I, you, you'll know your own particulars better than, way better than I, but certainly in the US, a lot of the movements responded by going on the defensive. In Reagan's case, uh, he, he initiated in a very dramatic way by firing the air traffic controllers, the, the workers that, uh, whose union wanted uh, higher wages and better benefits and working conditions, and he just fired the air traffic controllers. I, I don't know about you, but when, I, when I'm in an airplane, I just assume that there be air traffic controllers. I mean, it just, I feel safer. If somebody knows what's going on, you probably do too. And it was a very dramatic act, right? But it was the shot across the bow from his point of view. It was like, okay, now we take the offensive again. You people's movements have been taking the offensive. We are going on the offensive. We need to push you onto the defensive. And it worked. Our labor movement went on the defensive. And you know, the, the, you know what happened here. And the, the women's movement went on the defensive. And the civil rights movement went on the defensive. And the environmentalist movement went on the defensive. Movement after movement after movement that had been kicking up a storm in the 60s and 70s went on the defensive. Now, Gandhi and military generals agree on this strategic point. Nobody wins anything on the defensive. That needs to be on the ceiling, so when you wake up in the morning, <laughs> you see it on the ceiling. What do you mean by on the defensive? Trying to hang on to previously achieved gains. Right? Well, we got this far. In the women's movement, say, we got the right to abortion. Well, then it, going on the defensive means trying to hang on to the right of abortion. And what happens on the defensive is you lose, 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 lose uh, in steps as they push you back. And that's happened to the labor movement, happened to the women's movement with regard to uh, abortion and choice, reproductive choice and so on. All, all the major movements except for one. One movement kept winning and winning and winning ever since 1980, and that was the LGBT movement. Right? I can't tell you how amazed I am still that we've made the progress that we've made. Right? I mean, if you'd asked me in, say, 1960, so, George, are you, are you going to you know, achieve this and that and this and that in your movement? I would, no way. I mean, the bigotry against homosexuals is, what, 10,000 years old or something. You know, it's, it's lost in history how long it's been. And it, we're going we're gonna to make major strides against that. We are killed. We are killed. There, is, there are people whose sport is gay bashing. I mean, that is what goes on. And we're not going to make that kind of progress. Well, progress. George, you're in Britain now. Progress. Um, 
So, and what happened though was enormous progress, right? The AIDS period came, uh, ACT UP uh, in the US pushed the government around, pushed the pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals around and made steady gains, steady gains. Uh, uh, states got alarmed about the, uh, the next demand, which was uh, uh, equal marriage, right? And passed a bunch of state uh, legislation saying you, uh, it's, uh, and constitutional amendments and that kind of thing to prevent that from happening. Nevertheless, we have more and more equal marriage in the United States. And each time there was this cry from the homophobes, oh no, not, not that, no, we, you know, bad enough that, but not that. And then it was, how about uh, equal rights in the military? Oh, not the military, come on, we need that as a preserve of heterosexuality, oh my God. You know, this thing's crying and weeping and, uh, right, right, right. And we got that and, and it's this thing and now it's bathrooms. Is the, you know, I don't know what it is here. But anyway, the, the LGBT movement pushing, 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 never stopping pushing, right? And that's what wins. So, okay, you can disagree with military generals about strategy, you can say, well, what do they know? Or you could disagree with Gandhi. Ah, what does he know? But you can even disagree with folk wisdom, which says, uh, somebody told me the British version of it is, um, attack is better than defense. No, attack is the best defense. Attack is what? It's the best defense. Attack is the basic best it defense. Is it is defense. the best defense. Okay, so that's folk wisdom. All right, I know a bunch of you are intellectuals. You love challenging folk wisdom. Okay, but are you willing to challenge history, that historical record, where the movements that went on the defensive have been losing ever since, and the one movement in the U.S. that made steady gains is the movement that went on the offense? I think the case is clear. Okay, so that's, that's my last point for now. Uh, because I know you have a whole bunch of questions and challenges. But my basic point is that in the Nordic countries, they showed us how to do it, but we often need to turn to our own historical experience in our own countries to figure out the analogs and to understand, oh, well, th what they were working with was not special to them, but it was actually basic social movement uh, experience and empirical record and theory that can be drawn from it and why don't we uh, pick that up as well? Understanding there are always differences as well to pay attention to. So I do happen, I admit this, I do happen to love pushback, especially strenuous pushback. And I know this is the land of heckling, right? This is the, the debating land and so on. You're world known for this. So I'm expecting tonight some really hard pushback. So uh, we are gonna have someone uh, MC this part, but just before we do it, I'd like you to turn to each other and see if you can come up with a hardball question to ask me. Something that's really, really tough. And let's put George on his medal. After all, he's a, an arrogant American probably, really. So why not like, really push him around? So please turn to each other wherever you are and come up with a really tough question and then we'll, we'll have that kind of opportunity. Please do that right now. <laughs>